I'm recording. Did you hear that? Yep, got it. Okay, so, so I'll try to say everything perfect, but I probably won't, so forgive me. I'll write it time. All right, so this is just talking about $500,000 of life insurance. There's a minimum, and there is going to be a maximum, okay? So the insurance company determines what's the minimum. The government determines what's going to be the maximum. And our goal is to make this a maximum efficient policy. We want to get as close to this line that the government said as possible. And what is that this year? Well, it it's individual. So it depends on your policy. Every oh. policy has a guideline based on how it's set up as to how much dollars you can put in there. Okay. So it just depends on your policy. But we try to design those so that you get the maximum benefit out of it, okay? So that's what we're looking at. We don't wanna go over that line. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people use qualified plans. You're familiar with qualified plans? No, not really. Well, qualified plans are IRAs or 401ks. Oh, okay, okay, yep, yep right so So they defer your taxes and they, post, they, they postpone the tax in other words, and the tax calculation. So do you know anybody who you, you would loan money to and they ask you, what interest rate are you going to charge me? And you'd say, well, you know what? When you get ready to pay it back, I'll tell you how much interest I need. Right. Think they'd make a deal like that? But we do yeah. it every day, don't we, with the 401ks and that? Unfortunately, most people do. Yeah. So what tax bracket will you be in retirement? We don't know. And the idea is that you're going to be in a lower one because you're not working anymore. But I don't see that happening. The people I work with, with farmers, if you're a businessman, by I mean, you can do realty for a long time. I had a guy, 90 years old, I went to visit and he was a farm appraiser. And when I went to see him, he was not back yet from his latest appointment. He was 91 years old. <laughs> So Sounds he's like a guy I used to know in South Dakota. Yeah. He's just an inspiration to me. So the idea is what's the deductions you're going to have. I don't know if you've seen the tax history. This is the history of income taxes in our country. No, I've never seen that. Oh, okay. Well, it's quite fascinating. In the early years, you know, this was never going to be for poor people, but look what they did right away. Of course, we had the war, World War I. Mm -hmm. They went up to 73%. After World War II, they went up to 94% for the highest levels. And it's kind of interesting because even here, uh, when you look at the 70%, what they constantly do, the lower brackets, they keep bringing up a little bit. You know, like they said, we're never going to tax you if you're rich. If you're not a rich person, you don't make over 400000 a year, but we know that anytime, well, what did Ronald Reagan say? The nine most dangerous words, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Yeah. <laughs> so right now we're kind of inching back up. Trump set those latest ones, you know, and but they're ready to expire in 25. So we could see that going. Of course, the thing that was working against us is the debt clock. Can you see that debt clock? No. I wonder why it popped up in a different window. But anyway, we're about to hit $34 trillion in debt. So that's going to drive this cost of our taxes because they got to get the money from somewhere. So back to our deal here. Qualified plans, again, what they do. Excuse me, I bumped the wrong way. Here they are, the IRA, 401 SEP, the 403B. Um and what happens in the 1980s, the government set the maximum. It, when I first started with the Nebraska farmer, I would go to people's houses and they would have bought the year before they had a good year. So they bought a life policy and it had $11,000 death benefit. But how the guy got it is he put $10,000 in there. So that may not sound like a great deal, but what happened was he moved $10,000 out of the taxable realm right? So he's mm -hmm. no longer paying taxes on those dollars. 
Well, the government said that's a little too good of a deal for you. So they changed that in the 1980s with the, the TEFRA Act and the TAMRA Act. And they they made guidelines so that you had to have a bigger corridor between your cash value and your death benefit. So anyway, hmm. so the minimum would always be term if, to buy life insurance. Might only cost you $500. If you do a whole life policy, it might cost you 10,000. The difference being, of course, with the 500, you have no cash value. And here you build up cash value quickly. So that's what we're looking at. The difference between term and whole life. And we try to build this so that we're getting to this maximum efficient without going over and creating a modified endowment contract. That's what the MEC is. All that means is they're going to start treating the cash in your whole life policy like an annuity, which means the first in, first out. A life policy is last in, or, um, or I mean, the annuity policy is last in, first out. So you get taxed right away. Uh, on a life policy, you don't get taxed until you take all the bene all the original premium that you put in out of it. And then you might have taxes if you don't access that money properly. What we usually do is take a loan. Loans are not income, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so, you know, the government and their wisdom created these plans, uh, the qualified plans, the IRAs, the 401ks. And if you think about it, if you have someone who creates a problem for you, as in taxes, and then they create the solution might you want to be a little bit cautious about that? So yeah. what they've created is a guaranteed payment plan, you know, because if you're an IRA, they're guaranteed they're going to get the money back. Because if you don't take it out by 73, you don't take out your minimum distribution, they're going to keep half of it. So, right. okay. So their idea with these qualified plans was tax deferred growth. Well, with your whole life policy, you also have tax deferred growth. Tax-free distribution. Well, you can't get tax-free distribution from an IRA because you never paid taxes on the money, right? That's pre-tax money. So you have to pay taxes when you get it out. However, your life policy, you can borrow against this cash value and then use that benefit of your cash value, replace it, whatever you're going to do, or if you just don't replace it, that's up to you. In the early stages, you certainly want to replace it. When you're using it for income replacement later on in life, you probably wouldn't replace it. Competitive return. To put, uh, that, to put that in perspective, when you say early, you're talking like the first 10 years versus the latter four. Well, I'm right? saying when you're no longer working. You know, that's when you're going to take it out as a distribution for your, just to supplement your income. I mean, you know, you may have, it depends on what you do with your policy, but if you build it up and it's got a sizable cash value, uh, yeah, I often have people just take a little bit out. So they may, or maybe they want to go on a vacation and, or they, you know, and they're not at that point, the kids are grown, you know, you're hopefully set up and you don't need to replace that money because of what it, the, the loan is paid off at death anyway, so it isn't hurting anybody. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of benefit to that. Yeah, A lot of people do the IRAs and this, they go into stocks or mutual funds most of the time. And they're always talking about this competitive return. Well, over the last 20 years, if you figure it out and you look at the total return on like the S&P 500 or the um, Dow, if you wanted to use that, and you look at the the average over the last hundred years, you're not going to find too much of a different return than you have here with your life policy. Cause you always have to, you can't just look at the return, right? Cause there are fees and there are um, taxes that have to be paid, right. whether it's capital gains or just regular. So high contributions. Well, if you're in an IRA, you know, you're limited to what? Six, 6,500 a year. If you're over 50, you got to catch up. In the life policy, you can add, you can build that to add. For instance, the gentleman I was just talking to, he's going to add 10,000 a year to his policy. That's his goal. There's additional benefits. And one of those, which has become really 
important lately is the chronic care business. And you'll have a little benefit for long-term care in there. Uh, collateral opportunities. If something comes up, you can use this money. From like your life policy, you couldn't from an IRA because you'd have sell shares, right? Right. And then who knows if they're up or down when you sell them? Are they going to be up and down when you replace them and buy them back? Well, that ain't no kidding. Every time I have a lot of customers that struggle with that myself. Yeah. And later, later in life, like it's a problem. Well, you know, one of the biggest lessons I had, I had a farmer here. He had farmed for 40 years, turned 65. He'd always put money away because his accountant said, put it in your IRA, put it in your IRA. And he had a SEP so he could add more. He had $250,000, but he's a, he's a, he's a profitable farmer. And so he found a piece of land he wanted. This would help him with the down payment. So he cashed in his IRA. He got $140,000. Oh, I know. He was ticked. He didn't yeah. think that was a good idea. So, you know, there are no loss provisions with the life policy. You have guaranteed loan options. There's no application for the loan, right? This is your collateral. The insurance company just looks at it and sends you whatever you want based on that collateral. Unstructured loan payments, you can make whatever you want. You can set it up uh, for a year or 10 years. You can set it up for 3% or 5% or 10%. I have people that do that because they want to build their policy all the time. The biggest thing is the liquidity use and control. You're the guy in control. These are mutual policies, so when you buy it, you're a part owner of the company. This is your piece of the company and you decide how much is going in there. You decide when you want to borrow against it. You decide when you pay it back. So you have all the use and control. But it's like any business. When you started in the realty business, you didn't have everything you have the first day, right? Right. You have to build it. And this is like that too. The only thing we don't have is deductible contributions. But in a way, that's good because you have paid the tax. You don't have to worry about it anymore. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I just wanted to, did that help you at all? Any any part of that? Can, can we dissect some of that? On, sure. Just leave that page for what it is. I'm sorry. Uh, I was rushing because I didn't want to bore you. <laughs> uh, Okay, let's talk about unstructured loan payments. Okay. So, so I know I know enough up front when you buy the policy that the interest rate is set within the policy for the rest of its life. Correct? True. Okay. The the term to repay is up to me. Yes. But it's going to accrue interest. If I don't pay. Yeah, because when you when you borrow money, let me show you a little something else here. Let's see if I can get this up for you. Like a lot of times that borrowing and paying back is gets confusing for people. So I, I've done a little and and I take no offense if you criticize my artwork, but I did a little deal here about policy loans that would hopefully make it a little easier to understand. So can you see this window? Yep. All right. So this is you. You have a whole life policy. That's your collateral, correct? Yep. So you go to the insurance company. You say, I want to borrow $10,000. So the insurance company looks at your policy. And they say, oh, yep, you can do that. So then they just send you the money. They're going to charge you. It's always, all these are in about the 5% range. Okay. So you are borrowing from the insurance company's general fund. Okay. Your cash value, if there's, say there's a hundred thousand dollars in here and you're borrowing 10, when they go at the anniversary date of your policy to pay your dividend, they pay it based on the hundred thousand. 
they don't recognize that that 10 is gone. Yeah. Because you're, this is, it's like in your business, if somebody takes a loan against the house, well, that part of the house doesn't disappear, right? It's still accruing value. Right. And so the same thing happens here with the policy. So you decide how you want that to go. You can pay what the company is charging you. So you're just replacing your money. Or you can pay a little more. Or if you just feel like it, you can pay less. But you got to know you have a cost to that because mm -hmm. they're still going to charge the interest and it'll come out of your policy eventually, uh, whether at death or whenever. But so most people will charge themselves the what the company does or I just had a guy do a loan and he said, well, I went to the bank and they're going to charge me 8%. So I'll pay 8% back to myself because the excess is going to go back to your policy. Hmm. Interesting. So does that, does but, that help with the loan idea? Yes. But if it's accruing on what time period is it accruing? Is it a, like, does it recalculate every month or recalculate every year? Well, this is how, uh, one company does it that I'm most familiar with. They do the, like, let's say you do a $10,000 loan at 5%. When you see your loan value, it's going to say 10500 right off the bat. But let's say you paid half of that off before the end of the year. Then you're only going to pay between two fifty dollars and $300 interest on that loan. Because you paid it back, you didn't keep it the whole year. So they credit you back the interest because they charged you for the whole year. So See what I'm, does that make so sense? It's per year. It's not amortized every month. It's every year. Right. That, they yeah. just drop that interest charge at the beginning of the year, your policy year. Well, that's so that's a huge point because if I go to the bank and I get a bank loan, they're going to re-amortize every month. Yeah. I make my payment in December. They're going to re-amortize January 1, and that's the new interest charge for January. I make my January payment, they re-amortize, and then I make a new interest payment. And my, you know, my interest payment keeps going down every month, right? but it's recalculated every month. So right. what you're saying, it's only calculated on the year. Right. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a huge game changer. Well, sure. And the beauty of it is as you pay that off, then they they deduct some of that interest. Right. So it's just, I mean, everywhere you turn, I love how this works. So okay, that was one of my major questions. Thank you. You bet. You need to see any more of this? Uh no, I'm good. Okay. And how about here? Anything else on this? Uh, yeah. So let's see here. So liquidity, you, well, you answered that on that graph. That was up to 95% cash value. Right. Which is typically less than what I've paid in, but that changes over time. Like the longer I'm invested, the that More. calculation changes. Okay, and deductible. Your death benefit is always increasing, also. Mm -hmm. Deductible contributions. So, uh, you're you're suggesting that that if I put in ten thousand dollars, that's not a tax write off this no. year. No. So I I earn that money, which I pay income tax on, but I do not get a tax write off by putting it into the the whole life policy. Exactly. Okay, so what coming... you have just done is moved it out of the taxable realm to the non-taxable realm. Okay. And it's going to grow from here on out, non-taxable, if you use it correctly. Okay, so when I start with, say, during retirement, or when I slow down and quit working, I start pulling money to live my living expenses. Is that taxable? No. It's only taxable if you take out everything you put in and you start going against the gain. What is suggested is you could 
we can send you at that time, they can calculate how much you have put into the policy. And then what they would do is switch to loans when you got to the gain portion. So if you do that correctly, you would never pay taxes. Okay. Because a loan is not income. Right. But the the dividends would be income. So if I dip into the dividend side, then that changes. Well, it depends on what you do with your dividends. You have several choices. Normally, and almost 100% of the time, we suggest you let the dividends buy paid up additions. So let's, and I'm just going to use easy numbers. Let's say you had $10,000 cash value. You had a 5% dividend of $500, right? Or let's say it's 5% of, yeah, maybe $500. So that $500 may buy you another $1,000 in death benefit. So it goes right back into the policy. That's where the compounding starts. Because then next year, you've got 10,000 plus your payment, plus your dividends, and they're all gonna compound the dividend. They're all gonna add in, and then the next year, and the next year. And that's why uh, as you go in this, it just gets better and better. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, I'm good on that chart. Okay. So what other questions do you have about this? Oh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to give you an analogy and see how close I am. So based okay. on what I've learned, learned so far, um, yeah. I'm going to, the first few years, I'm going to have to just pay in, pay in, pay in to, to build my account, let the dividends start working, and let the system start flowing or turning, at which point that's going to be a good time to, to know I have the ability to take a loan. Is that correct? Because I'm not going to put in 10 grand today and get that out next week. Actually... I, I was just working with a guy on a deal like this. So he's going to, he's getting a million dollar policy. He's going to add 10 grand to it every year. So, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to open that up because his name's on it. Yeah. And I wouldn't do that to you either, but I want to tell you how much was available the first year for him. So it looks like, now his premium is about 6,000, okay? okay? So he's done the 10 above that. And I'll just get down here to the ledger portion. I might be able to just show this to you and block out his. That's all right, you don't have to show it. But anyway, his... So what happens? He's 48. The very first year, he could borrow against his policy for $9,700. He so had, I put in 16, because 6 plus the 10. And the 10 was all paid up additions. The second wow. year, he has 20000 Within five years, he has 66,000. In 10 years, he has 155,000. Uh -huh. Okay, so, well, that makes sense. The first year, so his premium's here, but then he added 10. The, the whole life insurance policy saying, well, since you put in an extra 10, I'll let you have 96 back. Right. To use, yeah. Yep. 
And but then, remember, and then, but remember, it doesn't leave your policy. Right. They're going to loan you a quarter. Yeah, 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 yeah. That clicks. But, Thank you. And it doesn't interrupt the compounding. That's the other huge portion of this. Right. Right. You're only 43. You've got a lot of years to make this work for you. I got a whole 50 years left, man. Yeah, it's it's just a fun time for you. That's right. Uh, the great thing, like in your business, because if you're, you probably have chunks of money at times. This is a great place to store wealth. What a lot of my business, I'll tell you how this has worked with a lot of my farmer guys. I'll tell them about this and now, you know, they're kind of going, yeah. And I'm sure you get that because you're a salesman, right? So they kind of go, yeah, I don't know. I'll try one. So they buy a $2,500 a year policy and they have that for a couple of years and they look at it and they're just kind of amazed. That's how it's working. And so one guy did that. Then the next year he came about two years, he bought a $13,000 a year policy. Two years later, he bought a $26,000 a year policy. And his last policy was 75000 a year. He said, it's my retirement plan besides. And he's already used that money to buy a farm. So, I mean, that's how it works. Just because they see it, they see how it works. Another farmer bought a plan. Then he bought a bigger one. He had, when the corn was $7, he bought a big a plan, put a lot of money in there. But then he also built a big house. So he overbuilt. So he had to borrow a bunch out. And then he couldn't pay it back because corn was $3. Yeah. So it'd been like three, four, five years. He comes in and he says, those policies worth anything because I haven't been able to pay it back. I said, well, let's look. I said, well, he made $8,000 while his money was out being used. So he has since paid that back. Well, a couple of years ago, he got a little tight in his operation. And the bank says, you're going to have to come up with $100,000. He said, well, I'll just get out of my life policy. And the banker challenged him. He said, you don't have that. He said, yes, I do. I'll have it in a week. And we got it for him. And he he got his operating loan, paid his loan back. Oh, so, wow. I mean, there's so many ways it works for people. Yeah. And now he's just building that up because it's for the next thing he needs, you know? Yeah. So that's. Huh. That's how these have worked. And it's it's just a joy to me to be able to assist people in finding this just great way to make your money work in more than one way for you. Sure. And, you know, like you, you're going to be, and I'm sure you've been there, in a position where you see an opportunity for yourself in the real estate business. If you build up cash here, you've got a down payment. You know, a lot of people have built their real estate portfolio using these policies so it's just a win-win deal uh, and the bad part is that you have to put money in it to get it going <laughs> right well and that's okay i mean there's nothing wrong with putting in and saving for a bit and cooling off for a bit and biding your time and then working the system like that's part of what i've come to realize watching the youtube videos with with the Nelson Nash Institute is right. Uh, you're going to have to save a little bit before you go. Exactly. There, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, no, but a, even you get in a tight spot, like the policy we just talked about the very first year, he can borrow $9,700. Yeah. And that isn't after one year. That's basically three weeks after he started. Cause we don't know when calamity is going to hit. Right. Right. We don't know, but that's the beauty of it. If he can get, you know, what would that be? That's probably 60% of the money he put into it. He could take it right back out. Right. We don't want to do that, but it's nice to know you have it if you need it. Right. You've got the right idea. Save for a little while, let it build, and then start utilizing it. What, uh, so I know watching the other YouTube videos, um, all four of them in that the them videos that speak, they talk about there's going to be additional riders coming along on the policy. Can you talk about those a little bit? Sure, sure. So I'll just use this one as an example. Let's see. 
And what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to blow this page up so that you don't see his name, but you can see the writers that he's got on his policy. And, you know, you get to choose this. So on some of these, let's unscroll this up and that's out of sight. We should be. Well, safe. here's, here's where I'm going. Like my goal has always been, well, not always, but for quite some time been, let's get into a position financially to self bank and self insure. And it's that huge. includes health insurance. Like I'm, I'm overplaying by the rules. Right. Well, that's where we come in with MediShare. So, but anyway, here is, you see this picture? Yeah. So this is the base policy this guy had. It was about $5,000. There's a terminal illness rider. That rider says that if you're, if it's determined that you are terminally ill, and, you know, you say, gee, I, I've always wanted to go to Alaska and I want to do it now while I'm feeling halfway decent. You can take half the proceeds of your policy and go to Alaska, which would be a lot more than you need on this policy because it's a million dollar policy. But you get the, the drift. Mm -hmm. That's what a terminal illness writer, it allows you to use part of your death benefit. But make sure you're really going to die. We had a guy, I think he lived in Minnesota. He had cancer once and he fought it and got over it and it came back and he said, I am not going to go through all that again. Give me half of my death benefit. I'm going to go to the Bahamas and I'm just going to enjoy the beach and the sand and my final years. Well, lo and behold, he got better. Oh boy. So <laughs> he had to work a way to get that back in there, but Anyway, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen, right? So he and, was given the opportunity to repay it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So this chronic illness rider has become a big thing. Because long-term care, and you're probably 10 or 15 years off of thinking about doing that. But the last long-term care policy I wrote was for about a $6,000 a month benefit because they have other assets, right? That's generating income, but they didn't want to have to sell part of the farm to pay for a nursing home. So they bought a plan that would provide them $6,000 a year with an inflation rider. That plan cost them $20,000 a year. So I'm just telling you that to illustrate the prohibitive costs of long-term care. This chronic illness rider will allow you to use on an accelerated basis, the the kind of like your terminal illness rider, but part of the death benefit and your cash value to pay for that long-term care. So the guy that I was working with on this, let me see if that's still open. Yeah, I figured this chronic illness rider for him um, on what this was right now. Let me get this up here. It was like, it was like 291 and his cash at the early point, you know, was only like $10,000. And before you turn 70, there's only a 25% of that benefit. But already just buying the policy has 80,000. And that other number you saw when I started, after 20 years, he's gonna have a million dollars worth of, of uh, chronic illness rider that he could use if he needs to go to a nursing home. And the reason he's buying this is because his wife's policy had it and his didn't. Mm. So anyway, so this is an important writer. Um, Just, uh, to be ahead. clear on that though, like the writer is there to use the money, but you're not gonna use more money than what's available in your pool. No, then they won't like let you. Right. There will always okay. be a death benefit here. Yeah. You so know. if my death benefit's a million dollars, I'm going to be tapped out at a million dollars. Right. And the, yeah, well, you know, it might, what it might say is that it would reduce your death benefit a little bit. So it might reduce your death benefit by a couple hundred thousand, but 
and your cash value, but there's still going to be a healthy death benefit there. It just yeah. depends, I guess, how long yeah. you need it, how long it goes. But when and you get up to the point, like I've got a guy that has over a million dollars cash value. Well, that's a pretty huge dividend every year. And he's only in his 50s. So if he keeps going, basically, he could take the dividend to pay for his long term care. Right. So it just depends on whatever works best for you. Yeah. But um, they do have this index crediting option. I don't ever recommend it because you're right back to gambling with the stock market. That was never my idea that that was a good thing to do with this money. But you can do it. If, you know, if the market, they keep selling, we're going to, you know, have this huge recession. Well, if that happens and you see an opportunity here and you think, boy, I want to take 5,000 my cash value and put it in there and see if I get a good dividend. You can do that. I don't recommend it, but you can do it. That's just me probably being an old man, being more cautious. I don't know. Well, that, that wouldn't be recommended from the Institute either, would it? You know, this came out after. I haven't really heard him talk about that. And there are some people that are involved, although I've not seen that in the material that the Institute puts out. But some of the guys, every year they have what's called a think tank and we go to it and discuss ideas. Some of these guys are using index policies where your cash value growth is based on the index. So I think that's why this company added that option just to be competitive if you really want to try something like that. Sure. And it's a year to year deal. So you don't have to do it forever. <laughs> so it's just up to you. And then there's waiver of premium dis for disability. That just means if you're disabled for some reason, this will pay for your policy until you're back on your feet. Okay. And it's also on your term rider. And then this is the, really the, this is the big deal right here. Your paid up additions rider. So that allows you to add, and this guy isn't maxed out. Normally you can times... You can use this base policy premium and multiply it times three. And that's how much you can put in every year. So theoretically, he should be able to put in $15,000 a year into this policy. Huh. But he wanted to plan for 10. He knows he can do more. Because his wife has a policy and he's been pumping all kinds of money into it. But all of a sudden he said, I don't have long-term care. I better get something for me. So, so and then here's the term rider. What the term rider does, it takes this death benefit here and the death benefit here, and it elongates that corridor, right? That's what allows him to put $15,000 cash value in there. But the term is only for 20 years? Right. So and you must... can do a 30-year term. He's, a, he's 48, and he's going to retire early. So he may even, after seven years, drop this. He's, he doesn't know, but he wants it on there for now. Does you it have work options. like normal term insurance where if you don't use it or you don't die, like it just goes to the insurance company? That's right. That's why insurance companies love term. 97, 98% of them never pay out. Right. But listen, I have run lots of spreadsheets on this. And the reason we build it this way, because it gives you a lot of flexibility with your paid up additions rider. So you can pump money in here and buy additional death benefit. For instance, this 10000 at 48 bought him another $41,000 worth of death benefit. So do you see what's happening? He is creating more dividend right off the bat. So that compounding is building up quicker, faster by doing paid up additions every year. Because when you do a paid up addition, the difference in that, Jason, is that here, this 250000 of whole life, that's based on his whole life till he's 100 years old. So that stretched out that payment to reflect all that time. When you put 10000 in and you buy paid up additions, you're buying chunks of paid up whole life insurance. So they get the full dividend every year. 
So you can see after 10 years, he would have bought $410,000 worth of death benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what, what I see when I run the spreadsheets is it's a little cheaper doing it this way because look at the difference in cost here for your pure death benefit. It's $1,500 for 750. Up here for a third of that, it's $5,000 almost for whole life, right? Sure. So this allows him to build up his whole life while still having the death benefit he needs today for his business. But he's gonna build that up over time, over 20 years. He's gonna have another $800,000, right? In death benefit at 41,000 a year. But if he doesn't die in 20 years, that goes away. Yeah, but also he's 68. He doesn't care. Oh, well, that's okay. So, and really, he questioned whether he needs it now. He has lots of assets. Yeah. So he doesn't really need it. But it, he's entering into a business deal where he has to have a million dollar policy. So for him, yeah. it fits in. And he understands this paid up additions because he bought this for his wife. Well, after he saw what it did for his wife, he bought one on his son. That other guy that I told you about, he bought four policies. He also has two on his wife and one on each of his four kids. So he's a believer. He's one of my best salespeople, actually. <laughs> so, Well, I, under, I understand his viewpoint being almost 70 years old. That that makes sense. Right. I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here thinking at 43 that that I'm not. Well, no. Yeah. And on you, I would probably do a 30-year term because you can drop the term anytime you want to after the first seven years. See, the, and the reason for that, those guidelines the government puts on there, it's based on seven years to start with. Right. Then re everything recalculates. But you always have to remember when we start something like this, this corridor, that extra seven fifty a term, is what's allowing him to put the ten thousand in, because it's creating the room between the death benefit and the and the cash value. Okay, Roger that. that but was... the beauty of these policies too is that your death benefit goes up every year. Yeah, it's not static. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, that, those so, are that'd be, that's, so that's basically all all the riders or just some? I think that's, I mean, you can get a child rider, which you might want. You can buy 10 to 20 or $30,000 term on, on your childhood that they can convert at 18. Although I would suggest getting a policy on your son someday. But you can get a child rider. Uh, what else is on there? Let me just see here. I termed out. That's mostly it. You get okay. the term right of the waiver premium, the child rider. Um, there's some other funky deals you can do where they blend term with whole life and it, it all kind of works together, but you can't see it. I like seeing it. So how it works, you know, over years. So you can see how it is progressing, but. That's those are the main ones. Really, the chronic illness is is just a huge thing. Because you know, you you see the nursing homes and they're expensive. I've had two clients pay over a hundred thousand a year. And it eats up farms. More farms are owned by nursing homes than China. Right. <laughs> And Bill Gates. Yeah, right. <laughs> Part of the 0. 0.0001% of the wealth, wealthiest people. That's right. That's right. Uh, so premiums, they can be paid once a year, monthly, yeah. quarterly. Those are the two cheapest methods. You can pay them quarterly and semi-annual, but it'll cost you a little more. But the beauty of it, you know, the paid-up addition that I showed you, you don't have to build that into your payment if you don't want to. Yeah. 
The minimum on the paid up edition writer is $120 or $10 a month. So you can do that. Like, you know, if you bought this policy and you said, I know sometime next year I'm going to sell a farm or I'm going to sell a house. Well, then when that lump sum comes in, you can dump it in your life policy anytime during the year. Or if you have savings and, you, you know, you're tired of getting zero plus nothing at the bank, then you can drop it in here and you they'll let you put 10 times the base premium the first year into the policy. So like this guy's policy with nearly a $5,000 premium, he could put maybe up to 50000 the first year into the policy. I have people do that all the time because they're saving it, you know, but they're not getting anything for it because they want it readily accessible. Okay, so let's flip the coin. Say uh, the lump sum doesn't come in and you can't pay that year. No penalty. Does the policy You got to pay the 120. That's the minimum. 120 a year. So you got to pay... The, go ahead. You have to pay the minimum every year. Otherwise, the policy goes away. Not the policy, but the writer that sure. allows you to put the extra cash in it. I'm a, I'm asking about the whole policy, like oh, you got to pay the premium. Yeah, that's yeah. That, so you don't pay if you don't pay, you don't stay. You don't pay, you don't stay. Yeah, that's kind of like yeah. the tough world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of like your rentals, you know. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. However, I shouldn't say that is always the case because you get down the road here and like this guy, you know, I told you in, a, in 10 years, he's got $155,000. Well, if he doesn't, for some reason, just hits rock bottom, doesn't have payment that year, he can borrow against his cash value and make his payment. Right. It's not advisable. It's not the best thing to do. But if it's what you got to do, you got to do it. Or the dividends. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Once you get to that point. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the guy getting into a business deal. Does that mean that he can assign, like, so if he dies, he can assign the business as the beneficiary? Right. And what, ha so. His deal, what his situation is, is that he's selling his business, but he's going to be there to help the new guy get along. So the new guy wants to make sure if he isn't there for some reason. He isn't just out in the cold. Yeah. So that's the idea. So if you're the beneficiary, I'm going to ask this question because uh, you know my world a little bit. <laughs> if I'm the beneficiary, how do I know he doesn't change the, the status of that beneficiary a year or two down the road? When you set it up with assignment, he ha whoever has assignment has to be notified. If it changes. So there's a built-in... Right. Safeguard. Right. The reason, okay, so the reason the I'm assignee, asking. The assignee has to release it, really. You just can't change that. You know, in other words, you, you, I buy a policy and I assign it to you. I really can't change that unless you say it's okay. Okay, let me give you a scenario because... I first got tipped off on some uh, using whole life insurance as a real estate tool about two and a half years ago. Yeah, I'd never heard of using whole life as a, a real estate tool until then. Right. One of the conversations that we tipped into but never got to finish because the buyer pulled out of the deal was... He was okay signing over his whole life policy and assigning it to the the beneficiary, meeting the seller, but he didn't want it to be there for infinity. No, 
You can put limits on it. So you can have a limit that the beneficiary has already signed off on yeah, and that's the time that, of agreement. And that's got to be some other legal paperwork. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably not just through the life policy, but you've got to have that in writing, notarized. You you right. know, you need to, it's a CYA deal. You yeah. got to make sure that everybody is in agreement and they're going to hold to it and that you have some backup if they should change their mind. So Yeah. Well, it was a unique deal. Like he was going to throw down 10% on the purchase and and use the whole life to as a insurance policy for the other down payment. And he was going to make payments. It was going to be a seller carry back. It was a beautiful right. thought process. Uh, one of which I honestly never been exposed to in all my training. I Did you watch the one on real estate, the Nelson Nash? The only thing I've watched about him talk about was buying that development ground where he he bought it using the whole life policy. Well, he bought a contract for deed and then the guy wanted to sell it for cheaper two years later because he needed more cash. And then he, he used the whole life policy to uh, finish the buyout and turned around and sold it. And he did the carry back. Right. I just wrote this down the other day. And when your name came up and I saw a realtor there, I thought, oh my gosh, I got to look at that video before I call you. But then got busy and I didn't get it done. So I was going to look up that name for you because it may give you some input. And that is the beauty of being part of this think tank. If I don't have the answer, I can reach out to those guys and maybe they've had an experience I haven't. And they can give us some input that would be helpful to you. So so part of where, I'll be honest with you, part of where I'm at, one, I need to learn more about this for myself because the more I learn, the more I'm in. Yeah. Second, I got a whole plethora of customers. We need to be having this conversation so I can turn them into better investors so we right. can out-compete some other buyers out on the market. And so be you're ready to be an agent. Zero. Exactly right. The fractional reserve banking is killing us. Every time they you, make a loan, they raise inflation. The, bank, the banking system is very difficult, uh, all of which I put together a real estate deal here in the last 45. Well, it took about 60 days to pull it off, but they were the right buyers. But because they didn't fit the box in the banking world, right. they got turned down. So I went back to my seller and I was like, listen, these are the right buyers. We got all the right stuff. So we turned, we turned my seller into being the bank. Cool. That's yeah. good. And we looked at the numbers and he's like, you gotta be kidding me. This is for real. And I was like, it's for real. The bank turned it down. Wow. That's all because it didn't fit the box. Yeah. And this is outside the box. And that's yeah. the other thing I love about it. I no longer use the bank. How long did it take you before you got out full on using the bank? Like, Oh, it probably took me, I suppose, 10 years. Yeah. But that's, you'll be a young man still. Well, that's kind of what I had in my head after what I've learned the last few days is it ain't going to happen overnight. It's going to take some time. The other thing that could happen for you, because I see how your mind is working. If we, you know, if we got into this and you got your license and you got rolling a little bit, that may help you really accelerate your own program. Because I think you'll see pretty quickly and you've got a pretty good handle. Once you do a few policies and you see how they're working for people, and, you know, also getting involved with Nelson Nash and the practitioner program. I think, yeah, it could be a real good partner to the business you're already doing. Oh, I see a huge opportunity. Like, yeah. Woo. Yeah. You don't, you don't like, for example, there's been a lot of customers I've had through the years that had the knowledge and uh, the where for all to go and buy it to flip homes, okay? Right. Simple as that. Go buy a house, do the work, let's turn it back on the market. But they don't fit the box at the bank. 
And that's right. always a roadblock. Oh, right. you don't have experience. You've never done one before. Same way with being a, a landlord. Oh, you don't have two years worth of being landlord experience, so we can't give you a loan. Well, how do you get experience if you can't get a loan? Exactly. Like you got to go save the cash and buy it outright. <laughs> right. It's like, if you don't need a loan, then we'll help you out. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm in there. You know, when I I've moved here. Many, I moved I've seen a lot of roadblocks area. through the years. Oh, yeah. yeah. 30 years ago, I moved here. I had to pay 10% interest to get a house loan because I'm a commission salesman. Mm -hmm. The bank would not even look at me until I had developed some things and they started. Yeah. But as soon as I saw my way out, I paid off anything I had at the bank. And yep. That's all. Well, Self-employed people are the most, the most discriminated sector of people in my real estate world. Sure. Well, it's big. Well, then we can get into a whole nother thing, but right. I really believe they're trying to destroy the middle class, you know? So. Right. Yeah. It, it isn't, there's, there's a discrimination in the lending world and it, it has nothing to do with what the feds claim as discriminatory. It right. is surely W2 versus self-employed. Right. Right. So I've, yeah. I've spent a good half of my career just, uh, advocating for self-employed and getting getting through well, some loopholes. It's that liquidity use and control that you have with this program. Right. And you know that the one guy I told you build a house, he was only in his 30s. He just turned 40. And he's got, I can't remember exactly, he's got two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars in a pool that's available to him. And he said to me, I don't have any friends that have this. And I wouldn't have had it if you hadn't told me about it. So, right. you know, it's just, it's huge what it does for people. So. I've been bucking the system since 2006, seven, five, whatever, somewhere in that time period. Nobody's ever told me about this. Right. Up until, like I said, about a year and a half ago, that one real estate deal was working on, which clued me in that there was something there. Right, but the real estate market's been so hot the last three years. I haven't had time to think, uh, sure. and long term plan or learn anything Crazy. new. Yeah, Just running so, from one thing to the next. Right, but it's slowing down a little bit, and it's time to get gathered back up on some of these things that are important to me. Right, right. Well, I think you'll. I think you have a lot of good ideas. I'm excited to see where you go with them. I'm glad to help you. I appreciate that. I was also going to share with you, I really appreciated your bio on your, on the practitioner website. Oh, good. Good. That was, it was very nice. Good. Uh, well, that's my story. You, you made, you made a couple solid good points that nobody else could drive home better. And, oh, good. Good. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord. You know, we always pray for wisdom when we do things like that and you never know who right. it's going to touch or affect. So, right. So here's where I'm at. Uh, I'm definitely thinking about it. I want to share. You recorded this, so I want to share it with my wife. I'm going to visit with. I'm going to visit with one, two other fellas that were in the practitioner group. Uh, I want to hear their viewpoints. Uh, of course, I'm looking at building relationships at the same time, so I'm a twofold right. type conversation. Uh, but yes, I am. I'm all about learning. So if we didn't cover something today that you think is important. Well, I'm, I'm going to find that real estate video and send that to you too. Okay. Well, and hopefully that book gets here by, hopefully by Christmas. I'll um, send I you think, one. I think, I think, well, it's already ordered. My, well, I know, but you'll have, then you can give it to somebody else. Okay. And your email or what you had on that form, is that a real email, the dot .realtor? Yep. Instead of dot .com? Yeah, I... so if you're a member of National Association of Realtors, yeah. they they offer the opportunity to use the dot .realtor for authoritarian, you know, authority purposes, basically. Okay. Set yourself apart from the rest of the crowd. Right. Well, when I, I tried to... I entered that in somewhere to send it to you, and it said it's not a valid email. 
J so, yeah, it's just Jason Walker at jasonwalker.realtor. Okay. And then I found the J Walker to real estate at Gmail. Also valid. Okay. So either one will work. Yep. All right. I'll try one or the other. I'll if you're the pro, sure. I'm already learning something from you. So I've been I've really uh gotten into a lot of YouTube and doing some some trainings with right. the local public and trying to be better at engaging everybody instead of just talking about it with my friends. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Right before Christmas. Yeah. I like it. Okay. We'll do that. Awesome. Well, God bless. It was uh it was fun visiting with you. Yes, sir. Um, Chris, hope we I can work something out and I really appreciate it. Forward. Appreciate your thoughts and your offer. Like you well, this is this is why we're happy. This is why you and I are having this conversation because in 30 years, I don't want to care about chasing insurance <laughs> other than this. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Exactly. Let's get, let's get self-insured and quit worrying about the rest of the world. Yeah. And that's huge. I mean, especially, and you use that everywhere, deductibles on your house, deductibles in your cars, you know, lower that cost of insurance. So you, you have more opportunity available right. with those dollars. Yeah. You know? Right. I can I can use that same premium that we're paying every month, put it into a life insurance fund, and right here we go. There you go. Yeah. Back to the last two hours we've been talking about, or <laughs> hour, whatever it's been. It's been good. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. So. All righty. Yeah. Well, I will put down for the twentieth, and okay. we'll see what you come up with. Awesome. All right. Well, God bless. Hey. We'll pray for the best for your wife and. Everything goes well. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you in 10 days or so. That sounds good. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay.